you. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm going to convince you about some stuff uh, about colors. Yes. OK, so just a little trigger warning first uh, that I learned from uh, my colleague uh, Eva over there. <laughs> um, so there will be a little bit of like cartoon blood and teeth and stuff. And I will quickly go through and mention a, um, a sexual assault scene. So if you're not cool with that, it's a, you can drop out at any moment. Uh, that will be a bit later in the talk. This is me. Um, I, I am a, uh, an art director and concept artist, and I used to live in Oslo until recently. I moved here about uh, half a year ago to work on uh, to work more closely with the team uh, at Triple Topic. Um, and the thing I like to do most is uh, to build worlds and create color schemes for them. Um, and I've been doing that for around eight years or so. So if you Google me, you will hopefully find my website and it looks like this. But I also do this kind of stuff, um, a lot more like technical and engine things. And that mostly doesn't end up in my, uh, the way that I present myself online. I also do a lot of like studies forever just studying how the world looks like and what's interesting about it. This is one of my uh, projects that I'm uh, most proud of. And this is the project that we're working on right now. Um, I will tell you way more about it later. So the, this talk is colors and uh, the project that we're working on, Dead Pets Unleashed. Uh, and there is some overlap, I think. Okay, so colors are not real. Me, myself, I didn't really get colors in the beginning. Uh, like, even as I was drawing a lot as a kid, like, I never clicked with colors. But then I started learning about the color theory, and it started it only started to click when I learned how they tick and how they work together. And then I learned that all colors can be beautiful if they're put together in specific combinations and in specific um, contexts. But for this talk, I'm not going to talk about um, color theory at all. I'm going to avoid everything that has to do with color wheels and contrasts and um, complementary colors and stuff like that. I can hear myself now. Um, oh, no, that's okay. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about the relation of colors to specific things, and we're going to talk about colors as we perceive them, and how you've all been felt lives, lies all of your lives. So. Color is a phenomenon, and it happens on multiple levels of, of reality. Um, we can compare it more to concepts like idealism or success. It doesn't like really exist, but we make it, it exist in our heads. Or a sensation like taste or smell. Um, so when lights are turned off, there isn't really any color, like it doesn't exist. You can't touch it or taste it or measure it in any way. There's a bunch of conditions that have to be met in order for there to be any color at all. And so um, it's not a constant property of a thing. Like the ball is red. For the ball to be red, um, you have to have the lights on. You have to, the person that is watching the ball has to not be colorblind or, or visually impaired the light that the ball is being rendered to you um, is also has to be in a neutral color. It has to be like a white light. And only then is the ball, in fact, red. So 
chromatic bias and uh, the, the way that we eliminate it in our brains. It sounds like complete uh, gobbledygook, but it's a system in our brains that um, is made for correcting the color on a thing while the daylight is changing, because the daylight has a lot of different colors. And it was also why we ended up with a very famous internet feud of 2015. Uh, this thing. So nobody could agree if it was a blue and black lace or white and golden lace. And if you saw it as white, it meant that you were interpreting the color of the dress, like like here, um, as the bounce light. And if you saw it as uh, blue, you thought that the dress itself was blue, and then there was just a, um, a flare over the picture. And it's a really bad picture, and that's why a lot of people got confused about it. Uh, the owner of the dress confirmed it's blue and black. But if you actually go into the colors and pick them from the dress and like analyze them in Photoshop or whatever, it's more like a gross shade of blue and a like vague orange. So actually none of those things are true. It's like blue and orange. So it's highly subjective what we associate with color and how we see it but I'm gonna run you through some functions of color and how we can use this knowledge, how we can use the fact that we are a highly, uh, that we, we kind of like interpret it a lot and how we can like guide people into interpret it in into specific ways. So we have color's identity. It's, um, that is about rec recognizability through color palette. Color is a storytelling device, is when you use color to guide uh, someone through a narrative. And then you have color as categorization, that will be things like color coding, which I think a lot of game developers are quite familiar with. So our game has colors. Um, and it's a, it's a narrative game. It's about feminism, punk music, being a demon, and maybe finally growing up. Um, it's the main character is a hyper relatable bass player in the band and she goes through her life doing life things and is trying to make her band succeed. I'm going to show you a trailer from the game. going to be coming out later this year hopefully you know how it is um, but um, we're gonna go through this list so 
color as identity. Um, it helps to have a strong color palette in order to build like brand identity for your uh, video game and also to have a coherent art direction. I'm going to show you some examples for how you do that. So you can probably see what this is based on only the proportions and the colors. There's not much other information here at all. Uh, it's The Simpsons. Here's another example. Um, South Park. Um, and Firewatch does this as well. Um, it's very iconic and easy to spot. Like in an instant, you just see that this is a Firewatch uh, image. And um, it's a famous game, of course, but they also did this really well with their marketing campaign where they will just uh, do posters like that. And uh, it has this golden burning um, color palettes together combined with the watchtower and you just instantly see what it is. Limbo is another uh, good example of how uh, uh, colors or rather the lack of colors uh, can make your game super recognizable. Um, so it has the sharp foregrounds and the soft backgrounds together with the only black and whites. It's just very sharp and very easy to spot. It's not a game, but uh, the Matrix series, like the entire franchise of Matrix, every single screenshot is easy to recognize from that, uh, those films because they're always heavily affected by greens. And green was the color of technology back in the day. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the green screens on like phones and stuff, but it was like the electric green color. So back to uh, Dead Pets and its identity. The original idea was made by Murray Summerwolf, which was the previous art director at Triple Topping. And he conceived of this uh, like band having troubles and going on tours together and stuff like that. And the, the game went through so many iterations before landing what we, what we have now. Uh, even in the gameplay of it, it was quite different to begin with. But we always had these like colorful people and pastel colors, which I thought was interesting. So when I came on and it was time to like build the art direction further, I didn't want to change it up too much because I thought it was quite special. So um, the vision was how do we like propel it further into um, these uh, keywords like nightlife, music, demons and feminism because that's all the things that this game is about. And it was like the, taking the essence of something that was already there. So we created a mood board and the way I go about creating mood boards is very intuitive, like taking all of the associations that I want to have in the thing that I'm working on and start grabbing images that I think fit. And as you can see, there's like a lot of Sailor Moon and like nighttime hangout kind of things, a lot of bleeding pinks into um, blues. So that's after um, picking all of these pictures up. These are the new keywords that came up and like magical acid uh, and surreal came into play. And then I made a color palette from that. Um, so when you're when you're making a mood board like that, you can use it for extracting a color palette from it. I think that's an interesting way of going about that. Um, and then we found uh, associations. And finding associations for like, like really feminine girly stuff, you also realize that these are very feminized colors, like the, uh, the type of stuff, colors that uh, women and girls are supposed to have on like wear them or like be in them like it looks uh, a bit like a girl's game but the subject matter is very like anti uh, conformity um, 
which makes this color uh, palette interesting because we can um, take that and mess around with the ex expectations of it. This is a story about a very like nasty and uh, inappropriate woman with very appropriate colors on. So um, while identifying, uh, identifying all the things and like studying the, the color schemes that people that were inspired by use, um, start referencing what elements are important there. What are the colors on? And so what I noticed was that it was colored light. And we wanted to use that uh, for our game. And so this was the first push into having a colored light approach. The top image is of how the game looked like with just the pastels. And then we started adding to it. And the last image uh, that says light pass is what it looks like, the, just the layer of light in Photoshop. And it's just hard light. And it did a lot for the depth. So this is almost exactly the same like scene. It's the same drawings and stuff, but it's uh, got light added to it. There's a lot of other stuff going on, like art direction wise, but the most dramatic changes is the light. When we're making sprites, we're thinking about local color. And then the light conditions change on top of the local color. So the sprites are one color, and when it comes into um, a light source, it becomes tinted by something, right? Uh, and just like that dress, the, the blue and black, uh, white and gold dress, um, we don't get confused by that, but we understand what kind of like effect that makes. And that is, uh, colored lighting is a total choice. It's not something that happens like absolutely everywhere all the time. We have some colored lighting, we have some white lighting, we have some dimmed lighting and so on and so forth. But here we're working with um, um, a lot of volumes and a lot of uh, colored light. Here's another example. The top one is just the pastels without any light information. And the bottom one almost didn't even change any of the colors in the scene when updating it to the current art style. Just added lights and darkness. This is the original um, protagonist's uh, flat. So we kept the messy energy of it but completely changed the vibe just by adding lights. It became more edgy. Yeah, so the color identity uh, has kind of like been achieved through that. And then we tried to push that across the entire game. So we have mini games, a lot of mini games throughout this game. And it keeps the color palette quite consistent. This is our uh, map uh, where you navigate throughout this world. And it also has this kind of uh, color scheme used in a slightly different way. Uh, this is Gordy fighting off her wet dreams, I think, uh, while practicing with her band. Um, and it's a little bit more upbeat version of that. This is when you have to wash your dildo every day. It's a little bit more toned down, but it's still the same colors. Here's a concert that they're playing, and then the uh, vocalist gets her period, so she needs to have a tampon thrown up on stage. You get the gist. Um, yeah, and so I just wanted to show you how we went to about it because it's not just to identify what kind of colors you want, but you also want to know how to implement them, uh, like technically, uh, and where to put what kind of information. I will explain a little further. So um, this was the initial 
prompt for how I wanted the lights to be. So you have the, these volumetric lights that taper off softly. And there was a lot of debate with this because does it look like a drawing if there's a lot of like gradients and stuff or does it look more like uh, Photoshop effects? And it, the answer is both, it looks like both, but it, it looks cool. So that's what's most important about it. Um, so we, we wanted to recreate the effect that we did in Photoshop, which was uh, hard lights, because hard light has properties of both um, hard light mode, like the layer mode that you have in Photoshop. Um, it, it can do both um, colored darkness and colored light, which is great. So this is a layer that we will have over an entire level in the game. Um, which is only clipped um, or masked to only the characters uh, in the scene. And that is in order for them to be affected by the lights, just like everything else in, in the scene. And it looks like this uh, in Photoshop. <laughs> so this is how I test it. Um, I just like put it in as a layer and clip it down to uh, the character and see if it works. Um, it's quite rough, this uh, GIF. And this is how it looks in-game. So you have, uh, the effects are kind of subtle, but if you uh, see, if you look at Gordy, the, the overlay on top, uh, you can see that she's quite a lot dimmed down in the scene and that makes her blend in better it makes it all more coherent and it makes the color palette and like our color philosophy work together. In movies, uh, when you want to make volumetric lights, you add particles into the air. So that you, that's usually like smoke or vapor. Um, and then you put lights through it and then th that uh, vapor is being uh, reflected off of and that looks like the light has volume. Without any particles, light doesn't really have volume. You can only see where it hits, like here, like it's sitting here. <laughs> but you can't really see the sun ray without like any stuff going through it. I should have brought some special effects with me. Um, and in order to have that kind of effect uh, in the game, because what it does is also giving some life into and texture uh, into the air. So we added grain. This is fake, this is completely fake because it was hard to capture on, on uh, a GIF, but uh, this is what it kind of looks like in game, that uh, all of the lights are kind of uh, shimmering a little bit and uh, making this noise. Yeah, that was identity. Now let's move on to color as a storytelling device and that is really exciting for this uh, particular project because uh, there's a lot of storytelling. Um, you can do a lot through color. You can um, communicate mood, you can communicate uh, the importance of something and uh, even build like associations to a certain thing. So like, yeah, um, and perception of color in this particular instance, uh, means a lot. In movies, uh, specifically uh, animation films, they meticulously craft these color scripts. And the color scripts, they um, tell you the emotional journey uh, in a film. Uh, they tell you all of the notes that the film goes through and the natural progression of the colors. We don't do this enough in video games. We could do this for a lot of stuff in video games. But um, Journey does this. Um, and um, I think it's quite clever because it marks progression. Uh, it marks progression in the game and it marks where there is descent and ascension quite literally. Instead of just using color, it also uses this like map uh, throughout the game. Yeah, we assume a lot when it comes to color. Um, we imagine color, we feel color, but it's just a state of mind. 
Did you know that the moon shines red? Um, in movies and art and stuff, we uh, often depict it as blue because we're like, blue moonshine. Um, but actually, if there is any color at all, it's very colorless, the, the glow from the moon. It's actually red because it reflects the sunbeams, the red uh, light waves from the sun and shines like slightly, slightly red. And that's on the complete other end of the color spectrum than blue. For some people, the sun might be black. The depressed don't really perceive color in the same way that not depressed people do. There's also a lot of other ways to perceive color, but um, the eyes, they still pick up and process the color, but your brain doesn't care when you're depressed. You're like, um, you've heard that a lot, probably like feeling blue is actually like feeling colorless is more accurate. So there was an earthquake that happened in uh, Armenia in 1988 and a lot of children got uh, orphaned and they ended up really, really traumatized and depressed. And so there was this rescue mission where they um, put them into like different sorts of therapy. And one of the biggest things, which is like really easy for kids is art therapy. They would draw a lot. And uh, what was really ominous and like scary was that these kids were drawing black suns. They were almost like not using any colors at all. They were just doing black suns all the time. And so they did like a little experiment, the doctors there. They took away the black crayons and paints and stuff. And then the kids just got outraged. They refused to draw. They didn't want to draw at all. Um, but then as time passed and the trauma like lessened uh, a little bit, then they returned to drawing color. In our game, we have uh, this um, heavier uh, kind of situation where um, this is the assault scene in our game. It's uh, quite shitty for our main character uh, to be in this. And the way we depict this is in monochromatic hues in order for, to tell her story um, and from her perception because she, tr she uh, struggles to see color. When she later then tells her friend about it, uh, as many people who've experienced uh, traumatic uh, things, you sometimes struggle to speak about the thing. So she instead lies about it and tells a, a different story where it's painted in rainbow colors. Another way to do narrative and colors is to show what the character is comfortable with and what kind of colors they relate to. And then after you've established all of that, throw them into a situation where they don't belong at all. So at her uh, very boring office job, there's like a really long hallway there is no colors at all. It's all like grayish greens. You can see that she doesn't fit in at all. She sticks out like a sore thumb. And in the mini games, um, we kind of wanted to be more upbeat. So we want to lift up uh, the player when you're playing the, the mini games. So the color palette is brighter. Now we'll come to color as categorization. That is color coding. And it's also a way to drive narrative, but I'll get to that. You've probably seen this a lot, this rarity systems uh, in video games. And this is an established system. This is the same thing. This is the same thing. Uh, the way that we use uh, color categorization is for narrative specifically. And um, 
we gave our characters uh, very consistent, and consistency is the key here, consistent colors that represent them. So we have these like uh, mini cutscenes throughout the game where we um, um, simplify a lot. And I'll show you how this works. So because Gordy is that color, no, notice her color, and then you see that's her. Even though it's really, really simplified and there's few elements on her that are recognizable, you can still recognize her color. And it, this is drawn in a completely different style mm, for a different effect, but you can still recognize her because of the color. Here she's peeing on a plant. And here she gets mansplained to. <laughs> there we go. And this is her uncle. So he has a very similar color to show the resemblance. His teeth are being stole, stolen by a monkey demon. And that's it. But another fact for you. Gordy is purple. She's not really purple, but uh, as we established, you're supposed to lie about colors. And purple isn't real. <laughs> I also told you that I wasn't going to talk to you about uh, color wheels, but here we are. Um, as you can see, this is the purple range of colors. Uh, but this is actually uh, not real because colors is not in a wheel, it's on a spectrum. And so what happens is that these light waves and these light waves are perceived together and we sandwich them in our brain and we say, oh, that must be purple. Uh, so it happens inside of your head rather than in the world. There is nothing that is purple that is being reflected. The closest you come to purple is violet. Shrek is green. Uh, I'm not going to tell you Shrek is not green. Um, I'm going to tell you a story instead. So, um, the color of Heinz Easy Squirt Ketchup, which was discontinued in 2006, was the biggest campaign that Heinz ever had for ketchup. And it was green ketchup, and it was Shrek ketchup. And kids loved it. Everybody loved it. And it was a huge, huge success. And the thing about green ketchup is that green is a color that people have on tomatoes. Thank you, 30 minutes. Yes. Um, like, you can find tomatoes that are green. And so you, you're thinking, oh, green ketchup. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, that's, that's kind of cool. Also, Shrek is really cool. So I'm, I'm going to buy some, that green ketchup. But then they wanted, they got greedy, of course, and they, they wanted to do other colors. What other colors can we do with ketchup? And so they went with purple and blue. That is disgusting. Nobody wants that. Everybody were like, this is artificial. I'm not going to buy that for my child. Also, Shrek isn't purple. So pa parents didn't want it. So th this is what it looks like. Um, so the reason why they wanted the blue, uh, to make the blue ketchup and the purple ketchup is because they did a study group with only children and they asked them, hey, you like this green ketchup? What is your other favorite color? And the kids went, blue, purple, but it doesn't relate to the food that we're eating, right? So um, if you're given a thing that you don't have any association to eating in that particular color, you might not find that so fun after all. So context matters. And for Shrek, the whole green thing was really good for their brand. But um, colors appear different on different things. For instance, if you're looking at fruit colors, uh, yellow might be a great color on fruit, but it might not look so great on like your teeth or inside of the white in your eyes. Um, a dress might be good in red, but it might look horrible if you just paint an entire room in it. That's taste, of course, but um, 
the context matters. Yeah. So, in conclusion, colors aren't really reliable or consistent or even real. But that is actually a really good thing because the way that it affects us is real and we can use it in our art. We can change the way that people perceive things through color. And it's an incredibly important tool. And the more I learn about color, the more I know about how it works, the more I get inspired to like, work with it. And it changes my perception of how I see the world all the time. Oh, I thought I'd put that in. Oh, OK. You can, you can go to uh, uh, Discord uh, to see the thing. Or you can uh, go to um, our, uh, there is a demo on Steam. And it's free. And you can go play. <laughs> It's, uh, sorry, it's uh, Dead Pets Unleashed. Uh, I might skip back to that after. Um, yeah, so uh, for this jam, like good take takeaways from this uh, talk. Uh, I have this, um, I recommend this a lot. There's a bunch of color palettes, uh, apps and places you can go to get a, a, a good color palette. But a, I recommend this coolers, like cool colors. Um, it does all sorts of things. It has like colorblind colors and like color palettes for different things. And you can extract color palettes from, uh, from pictures as well. So pick a limited palette, make it limited. Don't, don't go bananas. And then assign meaning to each of the colors and then be really, really consistent about it. And that's it. That's how you do colors. I also added this little thing. If you want to read more about colors, snap a picture of this, and you'll find some good information. I will, I will do questions now, if anybody has questions. Can I can I skip back <laughs> into the presentation quickly? Like, is that possible today? Like, uh, yeah. like this? To I just want the title. Okay. Yeah. There's like 90 slides oh, here. Okay, let's, let's do it. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure. Should I help or? No, I'm almost oh. there. Almost there. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Yes, this is the game. If you want to get the game on Steam, this is the title. Um, OK, yes, now I'm ready. When working with limited color palettes, what would you say is like the golden number-ish to sit around that you enjoy yourself? I like to pick like five. Um, but I keep most of them close to each other. So actually more like two. Um, so like one contrast color that like pops and the rest kind of similar to each other, kind of vibing with each other. Yeah. Uh, any tools to extract color palettes from, so you have all of these pictures and then boom? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing, uh, thing I recommend, recommended at the end, uh, coolers. It's called uh, coolers.co, like you can go to a website and... Yeah. So what I usually do is like I will assemble them together like uh, in either an image uh, tool like Photoshop or something like that or like Miro like keep them all together take a screenshot put it into that uh, app and then extract colors from that. Yes. How do you feel about um, 
a lot of, well, I guess color theory, for example, um, society has put certain meanings to certain colors, like red is dangerous. Um, do you use that, or do you like to break the rules, or maybe both? If you establish, um, so there is a lot of meanings that we have in color to begin with that is established by the society as a whole. Different uh, countries will have different connotations to different colors. But uh, for instance, like the color red, the color red is one of the few like universal colors. That's one of the things that we uh, associate with blood and like danger and it actually when we see the color red it will heighten our pulses um, and so that one is like the exception to the rule but you can also be like yeah but red means uh, love right and if it means love then the context has to change right so when you see it on a heart uh, it doesn't do the same thing as if you see it on like a cross mark um, somewhere. But I think that's really interesting actually. Um, different colors do different things for us and some of them are inherently like psychological, something that is more ingrained in us. And some other colors just are associations. Um, I hear that if it's a call to action and you use the color red in a sale, for instance, that's super effective apparently, because uh, then you're like, this product isn't dangerous. What's dangerous is me not getting it. <laughs> Are there any colors that you should avoid using at all costs? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say like, avoid certain color combinations if you're not um, comfortable with them. Um, if you know exactly what you're doing, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Uh, but if you, um, if you struggle with color, try not to go, uh, like if you see a color wheel, keep them close to each other. Uh, and then rather go um, put contrast into how bright or light something is, instead of going bananas all over the color wheel and like picking colors from one side and then the other, then the third, then the fourth, you know, like that's, that, that might be a bit too much. But I think all colors can work in certain situations. Yeah, is yes. That difficult because I can imagine, like, I can imagine, like, because it's someone else has started it or someone else has created it, and then you have to take, like, the responsibility for it. How is that working together, like, clashing, maybe a little bit with, like, different colors? Yeah, that, that was really difficult, and that's one of the things that I uh, struggled with in the beginning was, uh, like, how much can I change that? Uh, because there was something, like, really cool going on already, right? And you want to. You don't want like, to like throw it out, but at the same time, it's not the way that I do colors. I don't know how uh, that other art director thinks. Uh, and I didn't have the chance to learn how he works either. So uh, I had to like reinvent the way to do them, but still, still like, keep them kind of similar. And I think that's why we ended up with using like this, um, um, like a lot of lighting and stuff like that, because uh, it made it a lot easier for me to reconcile with pastels, uh, which isn't really a color palette that I do a lot. Thank you.